There are often F1 drivers that come along that have excellence in one particular area of Grand Prix driving. Such examples include Kamura Kobayashi, who is one of the best overtakers in the business, or Sergio Perez, who is a master of tyre management. However, there are some drivers who lack racecraft or ability to manage their car, but instead are very fast over one lap. More recent examples of qualifying wizards are the likes of Jarno Trulli or Pastor Maldonado, who often well exceeded the pace of their car in qualifying, but were very rarely able to replicate their form in races. What if I were to tell you, however, that there is a driver who is even better than both Trulli and Maldonado in this department, and despite achieving several pole positions, he couldn't ever achieve much in Formula 1? Let me tell you the story of Teo Fabi, the Formula 1 qualifying god. After a handful of years in junior formulas, including the New Zealand Formula Pacific series that he won, Fabi made his debut for Tolman in the 1982 season. He didn't qualify for any of the first races of the season, then qualified 10th in the 14-car San Marino Grand Prix, in a field that was so small because the Foca teams decided to boycott the race. For a more detailed explanation of this stage of the FISA Foca War, go check out my video on the 1982 season that I uploaded a few months ago. Anyway, back to Farby, he qualified 10th in Imola but finished 8 laps down and therefore was not classified. He then retired with brake failure in Zolder before failing to pre-qualify in Monaco before skipping the following two rounds in Detroit in Montreal. Another DNQ in Zandvoort was followed by two first lap retirements in Brandshatch and Paul Ricard, and then Farby's fifth DNQ of the season in Hockenheim, then he retired for the next three consecutive races in Austria, Dijon and Monza with mechanical problems. A DNQ in the season ending Caesars Palace Grand Prix capped off a pointless season and a finishless debut campaign for the Italian, and you're probably wondering, how can his career turn into anything after a debut season like that? Farby then sat out the 1983 F1 season, instead racing in IndyCar, he took the pole for the Indy 500 and won four of the final seven races of the season to take the runners-up slot in the championship behind Alonso, but ahead of extremely talented drivers like 1978 F1 champion Mario Andretti and Bobby Rahal. His impressive campaign led to him being signed by the team with the reigning drivers' champion Nelson Piquet at Brabham. He would also continue racing full-time in IndyCar, so he drove in both F1 and IndyCar at the same time, the last driver to do this until Fernando Alonso did so in 2017. However, his Formula 1 season started terribly as after five races, Fabi had only one race finish, a ninth place in Dijon. He then missed both the Monegasque and Canadian Grand Prix due to clashes with IndyCar, with Taylor's brother Corrado filling in for Brabham, but retiring from both races. The race before, his teammate PK had scored Brabham's first points of the season in Canada by winning the race, after having failed to reach the finish line in any of his previous starts. The Brabham team up to this point had an 85% retirement rate in the first seven races of the season. However, in Detroit, both Teo and Piquet finished. While Nelson took his second consecutive win, Teo scored not only his first points in F1, but also his first podium, claiming third place in a race only five cars were classified in. Teo then missed the next round in Dallas, leaving his brother to pick up seventh place, but after this race, Teo decided the joint F1 and Indy venture wasn't working, and so he opted to fully dedicate himself to Brabham and leave his IndyCar role. Consecutive retirements in Brands Hatch and Hockenheim were followed by 4th in Austria and 5th in Zandvoort before he retired again twice in a row in Monza and the European Grand Prix on the revamped Nürburgring Grand Prix circuit. Fabi sat out the season finale in Estoril, giving up his seat to Manfred Winkelhock, presumably because Brabham wanted to appease incoming engine supplier BMW by putting a German in the car. Teo lost his Brabham seat for 1985 and joined a struggling Tolman team that only turned up for the 4th round of the season in Monaco onwards. It seemed like his Brabham reliability woes had followed him to his new team, however, as he failed to cross the line under his own team in all of his first five appearances for the outfit. Then in his sixth race of the season, Farber did the unthinkable. You see, in F1, in 1985, the qualifying format was vastly different from what it is today. Nowadays, obviously, there are three qualifying segments, held back-to-back -back with five cars each being eliminated in the first two sessions to allow the top ten to go for it right at the end. This system has changed a lot in the last 30 years or so, we've had the god-awful elimination qualifying system from the first two races of 2016, the 2005 aggregate system which was a bit better, and the early 2000s one-shot qualifying which some fans still miss today. Anyways, back to my point. For the first 45 years of F1 until 1995, the qualifying system remained completely unchanged. There was a one-hour session on Friday, followed by a one-hour session on Saturday. That sounds simple enough. I mean, yes, in some years there was also pre-qualifying, but that's not relevant here, so we'll ignore it for argument's sake. Now, to finish off my cliffhanger, Fabi set the fastest time in the Friday one-hour session, having beaten second place Stefan Johansson by 1.1 seconds. 
Now, it wasn't uncommon to see smaller teams be competitive on the Friday just to see the big boys blow them off the face of the earth on Saturday. So most would expect that to just happen here. However, on Saturday, it rained hard and no one could get within 12 seconds of Farby's provisional pole time. Therefore, he took his and the Tolman team's first pole position in Formula 1. He knew it was probably not going to be able to keep the number one position during the race, however a slipping clutch that meant that he fell right back from the start and eventually led to his retirement on lap 29. From the race in Austria until the end of the season, Tolman expanded to a two-car entry, with Farber being partnered by Pierre Carlo Ginzani. This means we have a qualifying marker to measure the Italian against. I mean Farby, of course, since both drivers were in fact Italian. At the Österreich ring, Farby outqualified Ginzani by 2.2 seconds, then in the race was involved in the first lap crash, meaning he took over Ginzani's chassis for the restart, leaving Pierre Carlo without a car to start the race. Teo retired from the race on lap 31 with electrical failure, then Farby qualified one place higher in the Netherlands than in Austria. He was fifth in the qualifying session and 1.4 seconds clear of Ginzani in 15th. Unfortunately, both cars retired from the race with mechanical failures, but Farby's great run continued even if he wasn't finishing races. 1.9 seconds clear in Monza, 1.2 at the rescheduled Belgian Grand Prix race in Spa, then at Brands Hatch there must have been something in the water because Ginzani outqualified Farby for the first time. The next race in the penultimate event of the season in Kailami, however, saw Farby return to his normal form, beating Ginzani in qualifying by 9 tenths of a second and qualified in 7th place. Farby again struggled in Adelaide and was outqualified by Ginzani for the second time in the final round of the season. The year was plagued by retirements. He qualified in the top 10 six times and even got that legendary pole position at the Nürburgring, but only finished two races, one of which wasn't really a finish because he had completed more than 90% of the French Grand Prix when his fuel system failed on lap 49 of 53. Throughout the 1985 season, the Tolman team had been injected with some money by Italian clothing chain Benetton. Luciano Benetton bought the team and eponymously renamed it Benetton Formula. Farby was kept on as a driver and he was partnered by the promising 26-year-old Gerhard Berger. It was Farby who qualified highest in the opening round in Yacaparagua, 1.6 seconds clear of Berger, but he only rose from 12th on the grid to 10th in the race whereas Gerhard went from 16th to 6th and scored the Benetton team's first point. Farby outraced Berger at the second round in Jerez, getting 5th place ahead of his teammate in 6th, then in Imola, the Austrian got the team's first podium with 3rd place. After a double retirement in Monaco, Farby finished 7th in Spa with Berger in 10th, then the team went on a four-race double retirement streak in Montreal, Detroit, Paul Ricard and Brands Hatch. They didn't score points in either Hockenheim or Hungary, but then in Austria, things changed. Farby took his second career pole position and had teammate Berger alongside him on the front row. Berger got the jump off the line, but Farby remained close until he overtook his teammate on lap 17. He was about to lead his first lap in his F1 career and potentially win the race. That was until literally seconds after overtaking Berger, Farby's engine expired and he was out. After the commiseration of losing out in Austria, Farby amazingly put his car on pole position again in Monza with Berger four temps behind. Surely this was Teo's time to shine, time to put his previous pole position woes behind him. Nope. Problems at the start of the formation lap meant he had to start from the back of the grid. He would get fastest lap during the race, but retired again from pole position after getting a puncture on lap 44. He got 8th in Estoril and 10th in Adelaide, but this season was one of what ifs for Teo. What if he didn't have two mechanical issues from pole position? What if he had better race pace? Going into 1987, he stayed on with Benetton, but his teammate would be Thierry Bootsen, not Gerhard Berger, who had moved to Ferrari. Teo outqualified Thierry by 1.1 seconds in the season opener in Yacaparagua, but retired from turbo failure while running fourth. Farby again qualified in the top five in the next race in Imola, but more turbo issues put him out. After a few more mediocre results, Teo qualified eighth and finished fifth in Paul Ricard to get his first points in over a year, then got sixth in Silverstone to get his first consecutive points, scoring races since 1984. Retirements in Hockenheim and Hungary were followed by an amazing top five start in Austria and third place on race day. Farby's second ever podium and first since Detroit in 1984. He finished 7th in Monza then 4th in Estoril after running out of fuel on the penultimate lap. He qualified 6th in Jerez but retired with brake problems then got 5th in Mexico from 6th on the grid. Then he qualified 6th again in Suzuka but retired with engine failure. Adelaide saw more brake problems as Farby retired from a race again. That race in Adelaide was Farby's last in Formula 1. He was clearly a rapid driver, especially on fast circuits, but he had rotten luck and deserved way more than two third places as his best result during his F1 career. He was a race-winning caliber driver who had bad luck follow him everywhere. 
He would see success in American Open Wheelers and endurance racing, but not in F1. He is potentially one of the unluckiest drivers to lose several race wins due to no fault of his own, just like Chris Amon. And with that, that's the end of the video. Please go follow my Instagram, it's nedzo underscore F1, or you can click the link in the description. And I've recently made a Patreon account where I'm going to post audio-only versions of videos a day or two before they go live on YouTube. It's $1 or £1, depending on your location per month, if you'd like to see the video a little bit earlier. With that being said, please like and subscribe to see more Formula 1 content. I've been Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!